Welcome in to Bears Weekly, powered by IGS Energy, a Chicago Bears network production. Bears Weekly is brought to you by Advocate Healthcare, Athletico Physical Therapy, CDW, Connie's Pizza, IGS Energy, and Miller Light. Here are your hosts, Jeff Joliak, a.k.a. the Mayor of Bearsville, and his sidekick, Tom the Surfmaster Thayer. Halloween, everybody. Uh, let's go share some Cardinals over in Arizona. How about it? With Super Bowl winning Bears guard top there, I'm Jeff Joniak. And in the ESPN studio, spin of the dial tonight, Justin Pottinger. Thanks to our producers, Dan Brilli and Jordan Treadup and the Bears. And the executive producer of the Bears Radio Network is Eric Ostrowski. It's week nine, Tom. Bears jetting to Phoenix to play the Cardinals. 3.05 Sunday, changing the clock Saturday, so an extra hour of sleep. But I don't need it. I'm ready to play right now. How about you? I am too. You know, uh, 70 degrees for a high in Phoenix. It's really unusual. So I look for a fresher style, a fresher brand of football when you go out there, even though you're traveling. I don't know if they'll have the roof opened or closed. It's supposed but... to rain. Oh, it is. In okay, the morning so anyway. Yeah. Most likely uh, cl- closed then. So um, I'm glad you updated me. But it's <laughs> an exciting game. The, the Cardinals are an exciting team. But so are the Bears. So I, I expect a really fun brand of football on Sunday afternoon. All right. Uh, thanks to uh, Fox 32 Chicago cameraman Jeff Weiris for the update on the rain. So, yeah, we got to do Bears game day live bright and early there. And so yeah. we're, I think we're going to get a little wet in that game. Well, not if, they have the, game. not if they have the roof closed. <laughs> we're not gonna get, they're not going to get wet. Uh, we got all start, sorts of stuff happening here tonight. We got T.J. Edwards joining the program. Uh, you'll hear from Bears running back coach Chad Morton, Richard Hightower, Cole Komet, uh, Eric Washington, and the offensive coordinator Shane Waldron. All jam-packed in our show tonight. Tom, let's check the injury report first. First on the offensive line, you've got uh, Karan Amagaji, calf did not practice today. Braxton Jones, knee, did not practice today. Tevin Jenkins, knee. Was limited yesterday, did not practice today. So Ryan Bates limited as he comes into that 21-day window after being on eye with a short shoulder. Larry Borum, though, full. Uh, He had that 21-day window open up here last week. So, you know, I was asked on uh, Waddle and Sylvie by uh, Peggy Kaczynski and and Mark Silverman, what's the offensive line going to look like? And and I can't call it right now. Can you? Well, uh, well. This is it. So I was a part of that 21 day opportunity, that pup list that they have to make a decision within the 21 days. Right. It's not that you have to be out there for 21 days and then they make the decision. So to me, if they felt strongly about the way Larry Borm practiced last week and they feel that he did a nice job of going through the conditioning requirements that the staff put him through while he is rehabilitating his ankle injury. And the same thing with Ryan Bates. And they give you the best option of uh, veteran um, talent, then I would play them. I wouldn't shy away from them. But also, Doug Kramer came in and did a nice job at offensive guard. And so you still have options there. Um, And it's not like you're going to be void of – the proper number of offensive linemen to go to Arizona with. But if you have a game day Jersey, you just got to be ready to play. If you feel, and you tell the coaches that you are ready. Also uh, Jaquan Brisker and Kyler Gordon still sidelined. You know, the um, Kyler Gordon one, it doesn't make me nervous because there's a lingerance to a muscle, a soft tissue injury, a pull of whatever, whatever it is. But I am concerned and I'm worried about Jaquan Brisker. I'm not going to, you know, hide that because Jaquan is a great football player. He's a really neat guy. And I want Jaquan Brisker to have a long, successful, healthy career. But now going into week, this is week three of that concussion, uh, what he's dealing with. So um, I, I just want the best for I just want the best for Jaquan. All right. Uh, Shane Waldron at the podium, as he is each and every uh, Thursday. Uh, we're going to focus on on this chunk of it is just dealing with the pressure packages that teams come up with, whether it be blitzes, twists, stunts, or whatever, and how the Bears have handled it uh, week to week from the beginning of the season to where they are right now, and also a look at this defense of Nick Rattles and Arizona. Jonathan Gannon coming from the Colts organization, Philly organization, so they do like to pressure. 
operated at a, at a good level earlier on in the year. I think that's going to be a week to week thing. And I think uh, just as much as the teams that have blitzed us, it's the teams that have uh, shown disguises because we're going into another week this week with uh, Nick Rollis in Arizona where they do an excellent job of bringing exotic uh, pressures into those third down situations or known passing situations. But they also do an excellent job of showing that look and then uh, and then pulling out and playing coverage uh, on different uh, situations there. So I think for us, uh, all about the communication, I think Coleman Shelton's done a really good job of handling that communication at the center position, working with Caleb. And, and to me, all the pressure looks that we get, all the different ones that we've gotten throughout training camp, and we keep stacking those reps and keep getting better at those uh, every single week so we can always play clean against the blitz, which is a goal every single week. A number of times, Caleb Williams tell us he's missing throws that he wouldn't normally miss. When you go back and you look at those missed throws, what are you kind of seeing or diagnosing from those situations? Yeah, I think Caleb's just doing a good job of just building an a inventory of seeing these throws, uh, different ones that he knows that that he can make, especially you know early on in the games, and and does a good job of of looking to self correct, uh, looking to see, making sure feet, eyes, uh, rhythm is all in a in a good spot right there. And then it's when it's a chance to work uh, off schedule, you know, and and you know hits that that first throw and then clicks right in. And I think the 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 best part about Caleb though is if he misses a throw, he does. He has that forward thinking mindset, so he's ready for that next play, that ready ready for that next challenge. So he never lets that. Uh, a, a play before or an incompletion before. Uh, I look back to the Jacksonville game and interception. He doesn't let that affect his next play. He'll come right back out there, ready to fire and ready and ready to go through the process. And from you, from your time in the NFC West, you obviously have familiarity with Buda Baker. Mm -hmm. How do you describe his value to that D and, and what kind of strain he puts on? Yeah, I think you know around the league each week there's there's great a lot of great players on every team, and uh, you know and then there's these unique players like Buda Baker uh, that really uh, set the tone, set the attitude, uh, set the culture for a team and for a defense. And I think the way that that he uh, his ability to run and hit and cover uh, impact the game, run the alleys, uh, going against him multiple times. They talk about a, a fearless player that's that's always in attack mode. So he's one of those guys that we always have to respect. We need to account for. They obviously use a unique structure with how they're able to move him around. Uh, so it's a, it's a big part of our game plan and a big part of our, our week for a guy that we have a ton of respect for. What, what else stands out about their defense beyond Buda Baker? Yeah, with, well, starting with Buda Baker and then the ability to move around Collins or their different pieces uh, with Wilson, you know, when non-normal alignments, you know, they might be at uh, defensive line alignments. They might be at linebacker alignments. Uh, so they can mix and match. I think Coach Rollis is a very unique scheme. Uh, so it's something that we honed in on uh, starting work on, on Monday and then have worked all the way through, and it, it, it'll be a good uh, challenge to attack. Let's collectively as a staff figure out Larry Borum's readiness after uh, an extended absence and just trying to gauge where he's at. Yeah, I think Larry's done an unbelievable job. First of all, when he was injured, you know, going back to the preseason, gets injured, and, and that happens of staying connected, uh, staying involved, staying in with this, up to date with the scheme, uh, and he's worked his butt off to get back healthy uh, through that that rehab, and then gets a chance to get out on the practice field. And this is a guy that's played in games and played, you know, played at a high level. So uh, his readiness from a, a mental standpoint is is right there, physical standpoint right there, and then uh, you know, so we have all the trust in the world of him playing and playing at a high level in the game. I think you called this Cardinals scheme uh, unique. Mm -hmm. What makes it unique? I think it's unique with uh, the way they can utilize their linebacker spots, both on the ball and off the ball, and then Buda Baker, you know, where, where he's able to, uh, you know, with him, Thompson, with the safeties, the DBs, they're able to play a lot of blurry structures pre-snap uh, with a three-safety starting point right there and then rock and roll into different looks. Uh, so it's just, like I said, it's a little different than than other schemes. They might get into some of the final uh uh, coverages or front structures that are normal, but the way that they get to those is non-traditional. All right, so that's Shane Waldron, a portion of his news conference uh, today at Hallis Hall. Tom, uh, you watched the tape. Uh, what are you seeing defensively? That 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 front is really messed up with injuries right now. It is, Jeff. And, you know, both our safeties are good football players. It's not only Buda Baker. But, you know, I, I kind of don't like the fact that the press gets right into third down. Because, yeah, you're going to – let's – the first question that when they were asking about was third down and passing. No, 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 no. I, I, I edited that. Today, I know. So, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, because I think they're really blockable on first and second down. I look at this defense and it looks like a three, one, two defense. Wow. They got three, three one, two. Interesting. Huh? Three defensive linemen in stances, one linebacker that faces up wherever the running back is positioned. In, into the quarterback and then the two outside linebackers. 
But when you look at the positioning of the guy right over the head of the center in the two defensive tackles, they're kind of in the gap between the guard and the center. It makes them really double teamable, if that's even a word, yeah. because you're almost putting yourself in position where you can go half body to half body. And then you have that one linebacker that's going to flow according to the direction of the play. To me, when they talk to Shane about third down, I wish they would talk first about first and second down because that's the one thing about the Bears offense. You're going to have to be successful on first and second down, whether you're running a screen or just running the ball at the point of attack. And then you're going to be then you're going to have a little bit more understanding of what they're going to have to do on third down. So to me, the beginning of the question should always start with first down. And that's going to tell you a little bit about the progression of the defense. Yeah, he used last names. Uh, Mac Wilson's a, a starting linebacker, but they do move him to an edge. They lost their best edge rusher and Dennis Gardick to an ACL against the chargers. And of course the former bears all in there, Bilal Nichols and uh, Justin Jones. They're out there on IR right now. So, uh, and you mentioned uh, in our podcast, Kyrus Tonga is still there. Another yeah, ex-Chicago Bear playing yep. on, on the defensive line. All right, we're going to step away. When we come back, we'll hear from T.J. Edwards, the hitman, second in the NFC in tackles since 2023. That's coming up next year on Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000 of the Bears Radio Network. <laughs> this segment of Bears Weekly brought to you by IGS Energy. Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer with you as we're getting you set for Bears and Cardinals. I uh, had the opportunity to talk to... One of our favorite players, I think Tom uh, would, would agree, on T.J. Edwards. Made it, took the long way to get here, right? Undrafted free agent. And uh, he's, he's always got that in the back of his mind, as we'll learn here in this conversation. But, uh, Tom, the Bears, according to Pro Football Reference, have had the fewest missed tackles in the NFL through the first eight weeks of the season. Just 25. Some teams have 100 already, which is hard to imagine. <laughs> well, I mean, that's crazy. You know, look at a majority of these players, they accelerate into the tackle. And the reason they miss so few tackles, they're in perfect tackling position. They practice fundamentals. Uh, Matt Eberflus talks about the way and the technique he likes these guys to use. And we always brag about the way T.J. Edwards and the rest of these guys accelerate right before the collision. And it becomes a collision because their willingness to hit guys on the other side of the ball. And that's a, a good place to start in our conversation with the Bears linebacker. Everybody goes sideways or backwards. I mean, you Try. deliver this pop. I mean, uh, the way you're coached to tackle under Matt Eberflus and Coach Washington is significant. It's the hamstring tackle, mm -hmm. but sometimes you just can't get to the hamstring. You yeah. just got to take care of business. Uh, do you think the men that you hit feel T.J. Edwards? <laughs> Uh, I'd like to think so. You know, it's not like I'm always walking away clean, too. Sometimes that's self-inflicted wounds there, too. But, um, man, that's kind of just how I know how to play the game. And I feel like uh, it's something that's really helped me get to where I am today. And um, still so much room for improvement, man. So I'm just I'm excited every day to get in here and get to work and get to do what I love for a living. It's incredible. Captain T.J. Edwards uh, has a nice ring to it as well. Um, everyone I've asked about it who's become a captain especially when it's the first time mm -hmm. or early, they, they really appreciate it. Like there's just something different about it. You know, yeah. you, you carry yourself always. This is my interpretation also as, as a leader, no matter what, but to have that title uh, when you got it and what, and how you embrace it, what would, what, what, what's the feeling like for you? What's, how does that manifest itself for you? Yeah. And I think you, you kind of alluded to it, but I think there's so many leaders in this building, right? And, um, but I think for me, being able to, you know, get voted captain by my peers, you know, it's, it means something so much more. Um, and it's something, you know, I don't, I don't take lightly at all. And, you know, I try to just be the, be the same guy every day, though, right? I think, you know, the best part about kind of our captains in general is it's a bunch of different personalities and they lead in, you know, their own way. Um, and ages. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's what I'm saying. Like, we, we've kind of got it all. Um, but it's, it's a blessing, man, and to do it for – you know, my hometown team, my, my first ever time being voted captain, it's it's something special. What did they miss? <laughs> what did they miss about TJ? Um, hey, man, I think. They uh, couldn't peer into the soul of the yeah, man, yeah, right? Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I think everyone's enamored with the uh, the T-shirt and shorts, right? I think everyone loves that. But, 
Um, good thing for me is, you know, that's not what you play football in. That's not the attire you wear. So I think, um, you know, I think people thought I, I was slow and, and things like that. I wouldn't be able to fit into these, this system and in, in this league. Uh, and that's something that drives me every single day. And to this day, you know, I think I still carry that with me that, um, you know, like you don't think I'm good enough and I'm gonna show you why. So I carry that, that chip on my shoulder. It'll never go away. Um, but it's something that I love to prove, you know, to other people for sure. We can talk about tough losses all day long. Every player in every sport, anybody at any level have had yeah. that one tough one. But I keep being told if you lose a Super Bowl, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's the one. Do, do you do you still carry that with you and, and just being on the brink and not able to finish that? And as a lesson then yeah. to the rest of the room 100%. here that you can tell guys. Absolutely. Um, and you, like you said, there's so many guys who've had tough losses. Um, you know, Tremaine and I were just kind of reminiscing on that, you know, on our careers and things like that and the losses that we've took. And um, doesn't mean that this one that we had didn't hurt any more or less. Um, but it's also, you know, what that was our seventh game, right? We got so much, we got 10 weeks left at minimum, and we get to go show why we, you know, deserve to be in that dance. And we're going to go. Um, get those things corrected but at the end of the day like I think the, the Super Bowl one hurts you know what I'm saying because that's your last game of the year you're going home after that um so we've got we've got time to do what we need to do to get it corrected <laughs> what's the TJ stand for Terrence Joseph yeah you in trouble you get the Terrence Joseph yeah. or oh, man I've, I've do you heard love that. the TJ or would you rather prefer the ter Terrence it's crazy I've never um really gone by Terrence I think it's when I'm in trouble growing up that's kind of how it was. Uh, it was a Terrence, or it's like, you know, when I when I shank a, a tee shot off the whatever, I'm <laughs> yelling Terrence. at myself, Terrence. Like, um, but other than that, it's TJ. Yeah. They got any other nicknames for you in that room? Uh, my parents are around here. Both. Yeah, I don't. I don't really have uh, too many. I think, you know, obviously Flus gave me the Hitman one here. Um, you know, I think that's that's really it, TJ. My friends would make fun of me and call me Terry Joe back in the day. Um, my wife's name's Kelly Joe, so they always, you know, kind of make fun of me for that. But other than that, that's really it. Do you remember your first Halloween uh, costume? Um, or what was your go-to back in the day? I, I mean, mean, I had the I had, had, the, the, yeah. I had the classic Bears yeah. one, right? You know what I'm saying? I had the Erlacher one. Um, I was uh, I was Blade one year. I remember that. That was a good picture. Um, this past, just, you know, a couple of days ago, I was the Joker, so. Oh, really? Um, you what, what was that for? Uh, just a little team get-together, but. Um, the, the guys dressed up? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, come on. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Hey. You, you got, know, you who know won? what I'm saying? Who won the costume of the year? <sighs> who who walked in and you went, oh, my. This guy went all out. There were some good ones. Um, who was, uh, Tr Tremaine was, uh, was a Scooby-Doo, uh. Is it Fred and uh and uh Daphne and his and his girl? So that was uh that was a couple good ones. I think Keenan was the mask, which was a good one. Uh, the Jim Carrey one. So no, we, we had How a about good time. Caleb? Um I forgot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember. I remember. It was a lot though, it was a good time. That's pretty funny. Yeah. All right, Arizona. You've challenged uh, Kyler Murray three times in your career. I looked it up. He 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 hits you by ground, he hits you by air, yeah. and he's a hard little guy to hit. Mm -hmm. uh, I He's an interesting, interesting uh, guy here in a Heisman battle. What's the key to stopping him from hurting you too badly? I, mean, I think you nailed it. I think he's a guy who can do a lot with his feet, obviously. Um, and he can do great, like a great job extending plays, making the right reads. And you kind of, I feel like I've seen you know, his progression. Everyone's seen his progression um, from, a, from a thrower you know, standpoint. He can make every single throw. Um, but I feel like just watching the tape, he's doing a great job of just kind of making the right decisions and making the right plays and then also uh, being a playmaker when he has to. So it's going to take everybody, right? It's going to – and obviously we got a little taste of that last week with a runner playing a running style quarterback. But, um, you know, these guys are these guys are different in what they do too. So it'll be, it'll be fun, man. But we're excited. 
All right, T.J. Edwards, uh, a portion of our interview. Uh, we'll hear more from him later in a couple of weeks. But uh, the Kyler Murray aspect of things, Tom, uh, have you noticed anything different? Because he was here last year, recovered from his ACL tear in 2022. So he played eight games last year. He's already played eight games this year. Do you notice anything different about him? I think he's the most unblitzable quarterback in the NFL. Wow. If you think that you're going to put a one-directional rusher against a blitzer, I think you have to blitz from both sides because he has the ability to head fake. He's got quick twitch muscles. He's got a short uh, arm throwing motion, and he's impossible to tackle in a big space. Hmm. And so the difficulty of trying to trap Kyler Murray by a one-man blitz it, from the films that I've been able to watch, it seems almost impossible. And, you know, when you have a quarterback that's recovering from a knee injury, you always test him in some way, shape, or form. When you play against a quarterback like that that's recovered from a knee injury, then you better – that challenge, it better be processed a little bit more intelligently by the scheme that you're going to put at him. Yeah, he doesn't take many hits either. He, he gives himself nope. up sometimes, slide, feet first slide. But, uh, you know, a quarterback like that, hit him, and then uh, let's see what happens. He said, let's see how he responds. So hopefully the Bears can put the pressure on him and do so. In Glendale, Arizona, coming up on Sunday at 3.05. When we come back, we'll take a listen to running back coach Chad Morton here on Bears Weekly on ESPN 1000 of the Bears Radio Network. <laughs> Calling all Bears fans. Want unforgettable access to see the Bears play at Soldier Field this season? VIP official ticket packages are now available for every home game. Unlock access to exclusive ticket packages that may include entry to in-stadium hospitality lounges, pregame sideline credentials, and the Chicago City Pass. Visit ChicagoBearsVIP.com or call 866-202-5755 for more info. Again, that's ChicagoBearsVIP.com or call 866-202-5755. Don't miss this exclusive opportunity with Chicago Bears VIP. Jeff and Tom back with you on ESPN 1000 of the Bears Radio Network here on Bears Weekly. Tom, let's talk the running game because uh, things are, are percolating right now uh, for the Bears uh, ground game of DeAndre Swift. Um, before we get into Chad Morton and his look at it, what's been most intriguing for you over these last five weeks with Swift and, the off- and working with the offensive line and how he's created some big plays? You know, in the interior of the running game, I like that he's running lower and powerful. He's respecting the point of attack. He's getting what's offered to him by the offensive line. And we're not necessarily talking about touchdown runs, but we're talking about averaging four yards plus per carry. And then his vision on the outside zone runs is excellent. He understands how the blocks are going to unfold in front of him. He understands the patience that he needs out of blocker to get in the right position, and then he capitalizes on it. And then if you look at things, I know it's not a run, but I'm going to call a screen a run play because it starts at the line of scrimmage. He's got the patience to allow his blockers to get out in front of him, and a lot like an outside zone play, he gives those guys a chance to get in position, and then he capitalizes on what's offered him. The tight ends are doing a good job, and the receivers are doing a good job in the, the running got, running game blocking responsibilities. Here's running back coach Chad Morton today here at Hallis. Um, he's just getting more comfortable out there. Um, he's just really understanding the design of the run, um, what we're trying to get done on it, who we're trying to influence. Um, and it's just a product of him, uh, his attention to detail, studying. Uh, he's always trying to improve. Um, if you ask him right now, I'm, I'm sure he's not even close to being satisfied of where he wants to be, and I'm not either. So we're going to still push the envelope on that, and um, we still have a lot of room to get to get better and improve. What types of things do you feel that you're you're not entirely comfortable yet with, or that he's not? Just uh, is, is it the, from the simple to the complex, or, or somewhere yeah, just, in between? Um, just setting up your blocks. I mean, normal running back stuff, pressing the track, uh, make sure you're on the right angle. Um, I think that's really important. You're on your right track. Um, how we influence these backers to get them to where we want to go uh, so we can manipulate that. Um, just things of that nature. And um, he just, you know, he's just continu- continuing to grow in that aspect. And um, I'm proud of him, but we got more to do. I sure do love that crack toss play. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I, I want to see it every 
it's like ten times a game, right? That's just old fashioned football, right there. Uh, is that one of your fa- clearly one of your favorites? Yeah, it's players. great just because of um, what he's able to do with it too. Because um, a lot of times you'll see runners cut back maybe a little bit too early, but it's really the emphasis of stretching that thing all the way to the sideline and really setting those blocks, just not for the lineman, but the, for the receivers too. And there's a time to cut back, but the, the biggest thing is really stretching that play and getting those guys to run laterally and help set up your blocks. And then, then we can decide from there. But if you cut up too soon, you know, you see that a lot just throughout the league too, right, guys? They don't want to get stretched way out there. They want to hit it every time they seem a little seam. But that's not the design of the play. So it's things like that of just not running the space, but understanding the scheme and what we're trying to do. And that, that's a big difference. And so the end result, Tommy, 533 yards from scrimmage. If you throw in the passing game as well, trailing only Derrick Henry. Uh, first bear with four consecutive 100-yard from scrimmage games and a touchdown best in the NFL, that streak. Top five in receiving among running backs since week four and fourth overall receiving since 2020. So a lot of good things going on. And you hit upon all of them. Yeah, and you know, that's the one thing about DeAndre Swift. You cannot talk about him being a running back unless you talk about him being a running back receiver, because that sets up a lot of his game. When you're an influential running back and inside the shoulders of the tackles, and all of a sudden you bounce something to the outside and you're setting up for a screen, you have all those defenders bunched up in the middle, and then you've created some space for yourself. So Chad Morton did a really good job of describing the development of DeAndre Swift, understanding that he's not happy yet, But you and I talk all the time. We're not looking unrealistically at the performance or the production. We're looking at that a little over the four point per carry is what's going to do most to help your offense. This just popped in my head right now because we keep talking about how, you know, the Bears are not uh, hitting out of the gas, putting points on the board in the first quarter, just three points on opening drives. 10 points in the first quarter. I mentioned earlier today on ESPN, Philadelphia hasn't scored a single point in the first quarter. Um, would a would a, a a a steady diet of runs on the first series maybe just move the chains and get things going to set up the passing game a little bit more? Would that maybe get the engine started a little quicker, possibly? Yeah, or even uh, something that if you get into an obvious run type of formation where they know the defense, oh, we're, they're going to run the ball, I guarantee. Let's bring everybody up, and then you give Caleb the opportunity for play action. If, it's, if you get the opening drive going by deception or you'd always like to do it, like you said, by performance and be successful on first and second down running the ball. And I do think that this defense is going to give the Bears offense an opportunity to be successful in the early downs of a series and running the ball. Got to talk about Khalil Herbert real quick, too, because we did talk with uh, Coach about this, Chad Morton, and he said he's just been blown away about – not complaining about his situation, that it's uh, he's staying motivated because he's got to be ready. You don't know when your number's going to get called. He was healthy and active last week. A lot of that has to do with special teams. And, you know, there's good special teams players. Uh, I'm wondering if the new kickoff rule, because guys like Daniel Hardy are doing so well on special teams and, and, and bigger guys are out there. Um, that it takes away that opportunity to try and compete for time. And we know that uh, Homer's a very good special teams player. They value him very much a for, you know, a core special teams player. But working hard, taking all the scout team reps, you feel for a guy because it was in this game a year ago, he, he really ran well against the Cardinals at Soldier Field on Christmas Eve. Khalil yeah, Herbert. I, you know, I don't have any concern for the professionalism of Khalil Herbert. He's a number one to me. And last year when he twisted his ankle in the Washington game and then he was out of the lineup for a little bit, and then when he got back in the lineup, he showed his dedication to get back on the field and he showed his explosiveness. So Khalil Herbert, he's he's a true pro, but the position is really difficult when you do have a DeAndre Swift, you have a Roshan Johnson, and so and then you talk about the special teams component it makes those game day activations difficult to decide on. All right, we're going to step away for another break. When we come back, we'll hear from special teams coordinator Richard Hightower on the punting of Tory Taylor. We're going to go into the, the weeds on this one. It's a lot of good detail about how he's punting the football for the Bears, an absolute weapon. That's top there. I'm Jeff Joniak, and this is Bears Weekly on ESPN Chicago and the Bears Radio Network.
Have a new or gently used coat laying around? Well, head to your local Jewel Asco until February 10th and donate one of your new or gently used coats to the 36th annual Chicago Bears Coat Drive. Help keep Chicagoans warm this winter. Jeff and Tom, we talked about it on our Bears Etc. podcast. Uh, tip of the cap to uh, Bears Equipment Man and uh, veteran Bears employee, a uh, guy who loves this franchise deeply but also loves giving back to the community. He he uh, leads the way in Cole Komet, the uh, – the guy, the ambassador helping out this year. Thank you to uh, Jewel Osco, the Salvation Army, Tommy. We talk about it a lot. Donate a coat. Help out yep. somebody. Tony Medlin, head equipment manager of the Chicago Bears. His, uh, you know, when this thing began years and years ago, Tony Medlin kept this thing in motion. And it's clothed, uh, you know, mil- hundred. I don't even know what the number is really. But, you know, for 36 years they've been doing it. And I, I love the event as much as any event that, we go through each year. All right, as the Bears get ready for this Arizona outfit in uh, Glendale, uh, a lot of praise heaped upon Tory Taylor, Tom, uh, and the coverage units for that matter. Uh, eight punts inside the ten yard line. See, we used to talk about inside the twenty all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Now we got to start talking about inside the ten because we're watching this, and he had several in that game on Sunday. He's got the second most in the NFL and the most in the NFC. Let's listen into Richard Hightower and what he's been feeling about this. Protection unit um, did a phenomenal job in that football game, um, whether it was backed up or it was in the plus 50 area to pin those guys uh, to give our defense a long field. I felt like the Gunners did a great job outside getting in the face of the returners, and we challenged them as well as the punt unit to make more impactful plays, and the Gunners did a phenomenal job with that, something we wanted to do coming out of the bye. I thought Torrey punted better in this game than he punted when he won special teams player of the week for the Rams. He had an amazing football game to punt the ball the way he punted it and the situations that he was presented with and how he punted the football was tremendous growth, and we just need to get more of that. And on the first live play of the ball game, Noah Seward knocks the football out, and the ball just went their way. So in two back-to-back weeks, Daniel Hardy knocked the ball out in London, and we just missed recovering the fumble. We knocked the ball out last week, and we just missed it. So what I'm challenging them to do this week is knock it out again, but recover it this time. And that's and that's what I want to get done. And we got a a great group we're going against. You guys know I worked for Jeff Rogers, um, phenomenal football coach, phenomenal person, does an outstanding job with his units. So we know they're going to be schemed up. We know they're going to be well-designed uh, plays that he's going to have. And there's going to be some things that we haven't seen uh, that we need to be prepared for. Um, and I learned a lot from Jeff Rogers. He's going to turn every stone that he can turn. I learned a lot from him and I'm fortunate to have the opportunity to work under him. So our coverage units, everybody's going to have a, a, a an extremely challenging task again this week. Cause again, DJ Dallas, all right, he scored the first touchdown in this dynamic kickoff model and we got it. We got to cover against him. Yeah. He went 96 against Buffalo week one. So uh, a lot of praise for Tory. I know we, we both enjoy him. Correct. You know, one thing about Tory Taylor, so I we're going to do an experiment for the rest of the season. If we meet a football fan under the age of 20 years old, we're going to ask him if they know or they've ever heard the term Coffin Corner. Because Tory Taylor has brought that back into the vogue again, where it used to be a mainstay of punting in the, in the early part of the NFL, and then they got away from it for a while. But, Tory, if you think of a couple of the biggest impactful punts that he's had this season, they've been coffin corner style kicks. And that means no matter where you're kicking from, you're kicking towards the sideline to get it to hit out of bounds to give them that inside the 10 field position. So we're going to do a little experiment <laughs> here to see if young people know what the term coffin corner means. Perfect for to Halloween football. night, Tommy, the coffin corner. I know, corner. Yes. but I, that's why I wanted to – explain what I was saying rather than, you know, having people think that I was making something up. Right. Taylor, uh, 48.5 average, gross average. That's the highest single season punting average in Bears history if it holds. George Gulianix, I think that's how you say his name. I could be wrong. 1949. That's his, That's how long 
it's been that record. All right, let's flip it over to defensive coordinator Eric Washington, Tom. He gets to the podium, and he's quite serious every week about the opponent. He's quite serious about the Arizona Cardinals. This week, starting with the quarterback of this offense, Kyler Murray, um, you could describe him as a nightmare uh, for opposing offenses, defensive coordinators. This young man uh, has tremendous speed, arm talent. He can change the arm angle uh, against, the, against the rush. They've done an excellent job of protecting him. And he's done a great job of protecting the football. Not a lot of opportunities for inter- for interceptions. And so everything that we aspire to do, and that's get hits on the quarterback, to put him in uh, third down situations that would take advantage of what we've been able to do on third down, we want to we want to definitely work to get that done. And it also starts with defending the run. They're number one, or they're in the top five in terms of explosive runs with James Conner, big physical back, downhill runner, runs behind his pads, uh, the offensive line does a nice job not only of protecting the quarterback, but executing the various uh, run schemes and run concepts that they will feature for him. So we're excited about the challenge going out here against an NFC opponent uh, on the road and uh, getting ourselves back on track. Jacob Bart, first chance to see him this season. He got out there and looked like he was after the quarterback a little bit. The energy was was obvious. His energy, the speed, the quickness, the toughness. Um, I thought he did some really nice things, you know, as an edge rusher. I thought he was in position a couple of times to uh, not only affect the quarterback, but to hit him. And I'm looking forward to him taking a pretty significant leap this week. The strength of the, the, the red zone defense has been a theme all year. What did you notice in particular on Sunday? You mentioned holding them to four field goals and, and, and how you guys stepped up and made plays when you were down in there close. Well, it's been consistent. That that game didn't really reveal anything. I mean, we've been in a position that guys have done a, a tremendous job in that part of the field of understanding the urgency that you need and understanding that, you know, our goals are, are field goals and takeaways. We want to take the football away or force field goals. And so um, their urgency went up. We had to do things to defend the run. We had to do things in terms of affecting the quarterback. And everything was exactly what you wanted. Uh, Kyler Murray's been at his best when Marvin Harrison Jr. has been a factor. I know the Bears generally don't shadow anyone or target a receiver just in general, but how much of a priority has he become for a defense, and how well-equipped is this defense to kind of keep him off that A game that's this referenced to you? He's growing as a player, and you see why he was uh, picked and uh, where he was, and his confidence is growing. He's becoming uh, a person that, that, you have to, that you have to address, that you have to plan for. And um, his catch radius, the speed, the ability to, to get himself open and be in the right spot so that Kyler can get the ball out of his hands. We, we, have, to, we have to make sure that we do a good job with him in terms of shadowing him. Um, we, like, we like our matchups with our corners against him, all of our corners. You know, Tyree, obviously Jalen, and any, any other person that we try to assign to his position. So we just have to go out and execute, do a great job of making sure that we put the quarterback in a position where he's not real sure what we're in so that we can let the uh, rush be effective. Yeah, you got to tackle James Conner, man. He is one of the top three in the NFL in yards after contact. And, of course, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. starting to have himself a game. Uh, had, had himself a game last week, but really starting to emerge. Played a lot of slot last week, so they line him up all over the place. All right, when we come back, our final segment, Tom and I will talk about uh, the Arizona Cardinals and also a little – preview of our interview with Cole Komet that you'll hear on Bears Game Day Live on Fox 32 Chicago on Sunday morning. This is Bears Weekly on ESPN Chicago and the Bears Radio Network. Weekly brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com and request an in-clinic or virtual appointment to start feeling better tomorrow. Jeff and Tom at our final segment. Some uh, snafu going on, so Tom's on the phone. But, Tom, we're going to talk about Cole Komet. He is our feature on Bears Game Day Live on Fox 32 Chicago coming up on Sunday morning from Glendale. I asked him about where he's at in his career right now. How would you then describe your style from your not yeah. ours? Yeah, well, I think where my physicality is my main thing, and I think physicality in the run game, um, in my routes, is is a big deal. And obviously, after the catch, is being physical as well too. And I think that provides a tone setting uh, for the offense and for the team. And um, you know, I know the the offensive linemen appreciate the physicality, especially when I get the ball in my hands, and, and obviously when I'm in the run game with them as well. So um, I think it all starts there as being a physical football player, leaning into that, and then and then the other things kind of 
that I've grown with, uh, whether it's just been my, my strength, my, my speed and, and those type of things that have kind of come along, you know, over the past uh, few years or so. Uh, in the words of Brian Erlacher, the great hall of famer, every time they took the ball away, we got one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got one. Yeah. Quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. Right? He's great. We got one. I, I think so. I, I, he's, he's amazing. First of all, he's just an amazing person yeah. and he's everything you can ask for from a leadership standpoint of that position. And, uh, he, he's obviously grown into it as a rookie, but he understands everything that the quarterback position entails, especially here in Chicago. And I think he he uh, he understands the big market and knows how to handle it. Um, so he's done a really superb job at that so far, and that's been really cool to see. And then obviously the, the talent and the plays that we've seen so far have been really special. And I know that he feels like he has a lot more room to grow, which is uh, which is really cool. It's really and cool. Tom, I talked to Jim Dre, the tight end coach uh, for Cole today, and you know basically summed it up by saying he's never satisfied, and that that's always important when you're an NFL player. It doesn't matter what age, and certainly five years in now, uh, being never satisfied is a great starting point. <laughs> it's it's 100 percent right. I mean, I walk in the Hallis Hall every day of fear of losing my job, and I think that's the way that a, a lot of us are motivated. And I think when you look at the complexity of the tight end position and a guy like Cole Komet, he's capable of doing every single thing that's asked out of that position, and he can do it at a high level. So I'm excited to see how he grows along in this offense with Caleb Williams and every other moving piece, but we're just now talking about Cole. All right, one last thing before we go, Tommy. Uh, I want to talk about the defense again for Arizona. Forget about what's happening up front, because I've circled Buda Baker. I mean, obviously he's the biggest name. He's a five-time Pro Bowl, three-time All-Pro. He throws his body around uh, significantly, and you would think that's one of the matchups here with with Cole Komet, uh, one of those two safeties. But uh, Buda Baker, always around the ball, is is that a matchup to watch? It is a matchup to watch, and it's equally as important a matchup Buda Baker against uh, DeAndre Swift because if he runs through the interior and gets into the second and third level, you talk about the way he throws his body around, and I think that that's what DeAndre Swift is good at, either lowering his shoulder or hurtling a guy who gets his head down. But when you think of Cole Komet, I don't know if Buda Baker can cover Cole Komet man-to-man or have single responsibility against him. So if they do try to match him up against Cole, I think he's going to be an exploitable receiver. And I would be exciting to see that. And I think Cole has done a nice job of blocking whoever's responsibility is. And we talk about those outside zone runs. A lot of time it's the block of the tight end that's successfully done. Gerald Everett did it last week, and Cole's done it in the past. All right, Tommy, good show. We'll talk to you coming up on Sunday, 3.05 from Glendale, Arizona. That's going to do it tonight for Bears Weekly. Thanks to T.J. Edwards and all the producers are helping us out. This is the new radio home of the Chicago Bears, ESPN Chicago. Good night, everybody. Chris Black is coming up next.